The Argentinian organization Mothers of Plaza de Mayo celebrates 45 years of sustained struggle against the military dictatorship that ruled the country between 1976 and 1983. The Russian government has accused the member countries of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization of doing everything to prevent a political solution to the conflict with Ukraine. In Palestine, violence continues to rise as a result of Israeli occupying force actions. An Israeli soldier and a young Palestinian were killed. Hello, welcome to From the South. I'm Luis Alberto Matos from the Terrorist Studios in Havana, Cuba. We begin with the news. The Argentinian organization Mothers of Plaza de Mayo celebrates 45 years of sustained struggle against the military dictatorship that ruled the country between 1976 and 1983. On the occasion of this date, the Mothers of the Plaza de Mayo will gather at the Casa Rosada, seat of the national government in Buenos Aires, to render homage to their children who were victims of the dictatorship. The leaders of the organization call on the people to join this activity with the purpose of indicating the struggle and the ideals of those who oppose the repressors. During the day, educational and cultural institutions will also hold events to recognize the legacy of the mothers of Plaza de Mayo who met for the first time on April 30, 1977, demanding the dictators the return of their children alive. In Colombia, the Council of State suspended the extradition of the drug trafficker Dair Antonio Usuga to the United States for alleged violations of the rights of citizens who became his victims. The decision of the Council of State responds to a provisional measure granted by the judge Cesar Palomino Cortez after analyzing a legal action imposed by a relative of the victims of Usuga who requested the, to stop the transfer of the drug trafficker to a foreign territory in order to demand the truth about the crimes committed by the head of the so-called Gulf clan. On March 14th, authorities decided to withhold the transfer of Usuga to the Special Jurisdiction for Peace and to suspend the extradition considering that the drug trafficker did not appear as a member of FARC in the, in the reports handed in by the demobilized guerrilla organization. The government of Peru called for a dialogue between the farmer community of Fualabamba and the mining company Las Bambas because the conflict between the two parties has sparked disturbances. In response to the call of the executive Pedro Castillo, the farmer communities denounced that the transnational company MMG did not respect the agreement for the delivery of their lands. Faced with the company's refusal to listen to their claims, on Wednesday the farmers occupied again the lands they had handed over but were violently evicted in response to a court order. In view of this situation, the national government of Peru called the parties to dialogue this Saturday in Lima or in Tambubamba. Ecuadorian President Guillermo Lasso announced Friday night that he, establishing a state of exception in three coastal provinces, will be to be enforced during the next six days. Lasso said they will deploy a total of 9,000 troops, of which 4,000 from the police and 5,000 from the armed forces, to re-establish peace and order. He said criminal gangs such as Los Choneros and Tiguerones are allegedly responsible for prison massacres, which last year alone cost the lives of over 300 inmates in several prisons across the country. In recent days, there have been bomb threats to judicial buildings and a car bomb exploded outside a jail adjacent to the La Roca Maximum Security Prison in the province of Guayas, where the leader of the prison massacres are being held. The crime rates have increased in these provinces, and according to the information that the police have, these are the places where a stronger collaboration is needed between the army and the police. This affects us all. It is terrible. We are all affected by insecurity. We can no longer go to places as easily as we used to. For example, if you go to a restaurant, you can't go there anymore. Now you buy takeaway food because you can, because of the lack of security. Nicolas Maduro, president of Venezuela, held a meeting this Friday with the International Democratic Women's Federation within the framework of the World Congress of Women. During the meeting, the Venezuelan president emphasized the importance of holding an event like this when the country is growing. Maduro also pointed out that more than 90 delegates from at least 27 countries from all over the world are participating in the event. 
During the meeting, the head of state received from one of the delegates of Colombian flag as a gift and as a representation of brotherhood between both peoples. On Friday, April 27th, Guatemala was voted as chair of the Council of Ministers of the Association of Caribbean States for the next period 2022-2023. On behalf of his country's government, Guatemala Foreign Affairs Minister Mario Bucardo thanked the member nations of the organization for their favorable votes. In his speech, he highlighted the work carried out by Mexico, from whom he received the presidency. Guatemala's top diplomat said his country through the foreign ministry will continue working to promote economic and social development and will focus on climate change and migration, among other issues. The Association of Caribbean Cities, a regional organization with 25 member countries plus associates, since 1994, it has sought the integration of the countries of the Caribbean basin to create a common economic space, preserve the sea, and promote sustainable development, investment, and cooperation. During the 27th Ordinary Meeting of the Council of Ministers of the Association of Caribbean States, Nicaragua was elected to chair the organization's Special Committee on Sustainable Tourism for the period 2022-2023, together with Jamaica, the Dominican Republic, and Guyana. These countries will occupy the first and second vice presidencies and the reportership, respectively. During the meeting, Nicaragua submitted the annual management reports of the pro tempore presidency of Mexico. In his speech, he stressed the importance of resuming China's request to join the Association of Caribbean States as an observer state, pointing out that China is the second largest trading partner of Latin America and the Caribbean. In Mexico, Esteban Cruz Rosas, journalist and indigenous leader, was released after being kidnapped on Thursday 28th in the municipality of Tanganchiguaro in Michoacán. According to the state attorney general's office, Cruz Rosas was released on Saturday after an operation by the National Guard and Mexican Army who were in charge of tracking the victim through the mountainous areas of the Purepecha Highlands. He is currently being treated according to the legal protocols while the police investigation continues. Cruz Rosas, who is coordinator of the Communal Government Council in the indigenous Purepecha community of Okumisho, where he worked as a journalist, was kidnapped on Thursday, April 28th, around 2.30 p.m. local time, on the highway between Tangancicuaro and Charapan. Cuba state-owned biotechnology company BioCuba Pharma signed 18 agreements with national and foreign entities to strengthen the nation's alliances in biotechnology. The agreements seek to develop and increase Cuba's current capacity for developing pharmaceuticals, vaccines, and medical equipment. The agreements are the results of the Bio Havana 2022 International Congress, which was attended by more than a thousand participants, featuring around 600 lectures and short oral presentations. In this regard, BioCuba Pharma's Head for Science and Innovation, Dr. Rolando Perez Rodriguez, said the event represented a milestone for Cuban biotechnology. We are taking a short break now. Join us again after this. Welcome back to From the South. The Russian government accused the member countries of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization of doing everything to prevent a political solution in the conflict with Ukraine. Speaking to reporters, Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov said NATO is supplying weapons to Ukraine under the pretext of dealing with a Russian military operation in the Donbass region. However, he said, both the United States and the European Union are indifferent to the fate of Ukraine as an independent international player. In this regard, Lavrov called on all these countries to focus on humanitarian problems in Kiev while urging the West and international organizations to acknowledge Ukraine's responsibility for war crimes committed by nationalists and mercenaries in the Donbass region. Lavrov urged Ukraine to stop military and media provocations in the region.
Russian Defense Ministry authorities reported the destruction of 389 Ukrainian military targets in the last 24 hours. Defense Ministry spokesman Igor Konashenkov reported that as a result of recent attacks by the Russian armed forces, at least 35 command posts, 41 strongholds and 169 points of concentration of soldiers and mercenaries were destroyed in the Donbas region. He also noted the destruction of 15 rocket and artillery weapons and ammunition stockpiles in the advance operation on Friday night. Konashenkov also informed that in the last military aviation operation, about 120 Ukrainian nationalists, four tanks, and six armored vehicles were neutralized. The Kremlin said Russia's special operation in Ukraine contributes to the world's liberation from the neo-colonial joke of the West. During a press conference, Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov pointed out that the United States and the European Union attempt to hinder by any means those nations that carry out an independent domestic and foreign policy. Lavrov also urged Washington and NATO to stop delivering arms to the Kiev government, stressing that Ukraine does not need missiles but humanitarian solutions. The Foreign Minister also denounced that Ukrainian troops are using civilians as human shields and called on the United States and its allies to stop covering up the crimes of Ukrainian troops, otherwise they will have to answer for their complicity before the law. And on Friday, Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov affirmed that Russia will not capitulate to Western sanctions. The Foreign Minister stressed that Russia concluded that it cannot depend on the West for anything, especially in strategic spheres. He added that it is still possible to renew relations if the West realizes its mistakes. Regarding the new payment scheme for gas supplies, the foreign minister assured that the majority of Moscow's key partners accepted the new procedure. On the other hand, regarding the suspension of supplies to Bulgaria and Poland, Lavrov said that these countries put their ideological ambitions before the interests of their citizens. He also stressed that Russia announced the new payment scheme due to the fact that its Western partners stole more than 300 billion US dollars of what they paid for the gas. Headline inflation in the Eurozone rose in the first quarter of this year due to the conflict in Ukraine and the coronavirus pandemic. Estimates from the European Union Statistics Office Eurostat show that economic growth rose to 0.2% last quarter compared to 0.3% in the fourth quarter of last year. The GDP figures point to a sharp slowdown in the Eurozone where inflation rose by more than 7.5% this month compared to 7.4% last month. North Korean leader Kim Jong-un indicated this Saturday the possibility of using nuclear weapons in case of any threat by Western powers to his country. The announcement was made during the celebration of the 90th anniversary of the foundation of the Revolutionary People's Army of Korea. The president also declared his intention to reinforce the National Army to preventively and comprehensively contain any nuclear threat from hostile forces. Kim Jong-un's remarks come at a time when regional tensions are increasing following North Korea's government's exercises to test an intercontinental ballistic missile last month. We have more news coming up after a final short break, so don't go away. Welcome back to From the South. In Palestine, an Israeli soldier and a Palestinian Jews were killed in separate violent incidents that occurred between Friday night and early Saturday morning. Israeli authorities said that one of their soldiers guarding a settlement in Palestinian territory was attacked by two unidentified men who fled from the scene in a vehicle. Hours later, the Ministry of Health of Palestine reported the death of a young Palestinian man of approximately 20 years of age in the city of Asun from a bullet wound during a raid by Israeli forces. The resistant movement Hamas called the incident with the soldier in Tel Aviv a heroic operation to conclude the holy month of Ramadan. Syrian President Bashar al-Assad issued on Saturday a legislative decree pardoning the authors of terrorist acts committed before April 30, 2022. In accordance with the laws of that country, the amnesty will not benefit prisoners involved in crimes that resulted in people's death. How 
However, those citizens who are denied this alternative may submit a lawsuit in court. Analysts consider that the pardons are part of the tolerance and pacification policy promoted by the national government. The United Nations regretted the lack of, of financial, international financial aid to Yemen, which is experiencing a humanitarian crisis as a result of the war that began in 2014. Through a statement, the multilateral organization's population fund assured that the lack of funding forced it to reduce protection interventions in Yemen, while warning that at least 23 million citizens will require some type of humanitarian assistance during 2022. The institution affirmed that more than 4 million people in Yemen were displaced from their homes as a consequence of devastated economy and precarious health system. The UN Office for the Cooperation of Humanitarian Affairs warned in a recent report that by 2022, some 2.2 million children and 1.3 million pregnant or lactating women will suffer acute malnutrition in the country. And Kenya held on Friday a state funeral for former President Mwai Kibaki, who died age 90 last week and whose decade in power was marked by economic revival. Kibaki was the third head of state in Kenya's history, serving from December 2002 to April 2013. Benches at Niyayo National Stadium in the heart of the capital, Nairobi, were full under a heavy sky as the procession accompanying Kibaki coffin arrived. Alongside ambassadors, officials, and members of the government, a dozen of Heads of state and prime ministers were expected from across the African continent, including South African President Cyril Ramaphosa and South Sudanese President Salva Kiir. A fellow Kenyans, we congregate here today to, one, to honor one of the founding fathers of our beloved nation. We are here not only to mourn an incalculable loss, but also to celebrate a magnificent life. We celebrate a man of faith, a man of family, a man of honor, and a man who always put Kenya and Kenyans first. We remember President Kibaki for the leadership that he demonstrated, not only to Kenya, but also to the African continent. We remember him for his commitment to the people of Kenya and indeed to all of us as Africans. Thousands of Iranians took to the streets Friday to join annual pro-Palestinian rallies as Israeli-Palestinian clashes in Jerusalem left dozens injured. The state broadcaster Rip reported that the Quds Day commemorations, which are held on last Friday of the Muslim holy month of Ramadan, were launched in 1979 by Iran's revolutionary leader Ayatollah Ruhollah Khomeini. Flag-waving protesters across Iran chanted death to America and death to Israel. They also held up signs reading, Jerusalem is ours and Kuz Day is the day of Islam. The rallies took place in the capital Tehran and several Iranian cities. In the central Chinese city of Changsha in the Hunan province, at least 23 people remain trapped under an eight-story collapse building. Officials from the city's major office report that around 39 others are still reported missing, whereas five people were pulled from the rubble and sent to hospitals overnight. The building, which housed a hotel, apartments, and a cinema, caved in Friday afternoon, leaving a gaping hole in a densely built street. Authorities are still investigating the cause of the tragedy, but they say the building had suffered several structural changes by the hand of its tenants over the years. Chinese Foreign Ministry spokesman Xiao Lijian said on Friday that the United States has been using its human rights reports as a tool to defame and coerce other countries. The Chinese official made the remarks at a press briefing when commenting on the 2021 country reports on human rights practices released by the U.S. State Department recently. The report has been widely criticized by many countries including Cuba, India, Iran and Turkey.
On Saturday, the Municipal Health Commission said a total of 47 new deaths were reported in the current COVID-19 outbreak in Shanghai on Friday, while hundreds of thousands are currently under quarantine. Of midnight Friday, there were 356 patients in severe conditions and 57 in critical condition receiving treatment in designated medical institutions. On Friday, 47 new deaths were reported in Shanghai, with an average age of 82.4. As of 9 a.m. Saturday, a total of 631,175 close contacts have been traced in Shanghai in the current round of outbreak, and all of them have been put on the quarantine. A total of 2,807 local cases were discharged from hospital in Shanghai, and 13,605 asymptomatic cases were lifted out of centralized quarantine for medical observation. They will return to their places of residence for further health monitoring. We have come to the end of this news brief, and we can find these and many other stories on our website at telesorenglish.net. You can also join us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Telegram. For Telesor English, I'm Luis Alberto Matos. As always, thank you for watching.